Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. It's Tori and today we're going to be talking about all of the books that I read in the month of August this year. Um, what, what a crazy month, honestly. Like, I read so much manga this month because I kind of needed a brain break. It's been really wild here at the end of summer with my kids' activities and just running all over the place. You know how summer gets. So let's get into it. The first book that I finished this month was actually an audiobook read, which you know, I think I have officially found a audiobook narrator that has made me fall in love with the format of audiobooks, which I'm really excited about because audiobooks were something that I've always struggled with. And I finally found an audiobook narrator that I absolutely love, 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 love. I finished Feet of Clay by Terry Pratchett. This is book three in his City Watch series that fits into the wider Discworld universe. And you guys, I just gotta say, I'm so incredibly in love with this series and these characters and Terry Pratchett's writing style. I have found a new favorite author and I know that. I'm, I'm just, I'm so giddy about it because it is the best feeling to find an author new to you that you can, you just, you just know this is gonna be Gesundheit an amazing time and you just fall in love with their writing style and their stories and that has been Terry Pratchett for me this year. I am so excited to keep reading on in the Discworld universe. Feet of Clay is a continuation of the story of Captain Sam Vimes, uh, who we meet in Guards Guards, and his bumbling mis crew of misfits that make up the city watch of Ankh Morpork. The story that Terry Pratchett tells in this series and in the Discworld in general is very humorous, and I appreciate that about it because humor is something that I am very hit or miss with in my fantasy novels because most of the time I feel like it feels forced. It's not really funny, it's meant to be funny. Terry Pratchett has a just razor sharp wit when it comes to this, and what makes it so beautiful is you can tell that the humor comes from a lot of experience and love for the fantasy genre. So when he pokes fun at all of the things we know and love about fantasy, it works and it's funny and it's deep. And he'll twist it around so quickly and give you deep themes alongside that humor. It's just brilliant. Out of the three that I've read so far, I would say Feet of Clay is probably my second favorite. Men at Arms book two is still my favorite, and that was the book that I think really kick-started my deeper love of Terry Pratchett as a writer. I really enjoyed Guards Guards, but Men at Arms was just S-tier fantasy for me. And then Feet of Clay definitely continued a lot of the same vibes that I got with book two, and I loved it. I didn't love it quite as much as I loved book two, but I am just so happy to spend more time with these characters, and it's just, it's everything in the kitchen sink, honestly. You've got trolls, you've got assassins, you've got um, bumbling city watchmen, golems, you've got vampires, you've got werewolves, everything's in there and it's just, it just works. It's such, it's such a good series, you guys. If you're gonna read The City Watch, I cannot recommend highly enough listening to the audiobooks. John Culshaw is just brilliant. He brings these characters to life so well. The voices are amazing. Bill Nye reads the footnotes, not Bill Nye the science guy, but Bill Nye, J.V. Jones. And uh, Peter Serafinowicz plays the voice of death. So please check out the audiobooks, you guys, because they are absolutely brilliant. Um, hands down my favorite audiobooks I've ever listened to and may have single-handedly made me love audiobooks in general. Moving on to the rest of what I read this month. Um, the first physical novel that I read this month was Isla's Reach by Francesca Liliana. Before this book starts, long ago there was a war that wiped out all of the dragons and their riders, and our main character is a young woman who is born with the blood of those dragon riders in her veins, and she is able to bond with the last known living dragon. And it starts out very much in that kind of typical, okay, we are, have a coming of age dragon rider fantasy, 
and then it really starts to get dark and there are twists and turns all over the place that really remove this from I think the stock kind of chosen one dragon rider fantasy because it is not that. It starts out suggesting that and then twists and subverts it very very quickly. The other two POVs in this book are a bounty hunter that our main character p converges paths with eventually and also an assassin who is hunting her. Now this book has a lot going for it. The premise is really really interesting. The concepts I really enjoyed. I like the way that she's subverting that dragon rider type fantasy and the prologue of this book is one of the best prologues I think I've ever read in fantasy. It was so gripping. I was immersed immediately. I cared about the characters immediately. And I was just, I was all in. Now, because those characters in the prologue gripped me so much, I did struggle a little bit when we then jumped ahead in time and those were not the characters that were the focus of the story. The other thing that did trip me up with this book a little bit is the prose style does definitely cross the line of, of very purple prose in my opinion. It, it really is heavy handed throughout a lot of the story. Um, and I think really takes away from the characters and the concepts, at least for me. And there were definitely a lot of moments where the sentence structure was just very confusing and didn't quite work. And I had to go back and try to figure out what exactly was being said. I think the strength of this book really comes in with the concepts of, of the world that Francesca Liliana created here and the ways that she is playing with common fantasy tropes and breaking them down, sometimes literally. Um, and she absolutely does not shy away from the grim dark side of her, the reality of living in her world. And I appreciated that. And I definitely am interested to see where she goes uh, from the ending of this story, because I think there's a lot of different directions she could take this that would be really interesting. Moving on to my next read, which was an ebook, and that is One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He was the author of the Gulag Archipelago, which is probably one of his better known works um, that talks about the Gulags in the Soviet Union. Um, and this book, I'm not a stranger to um, concentration camp style memoirs and fiction. This one was a bit of a struggle for me. When it comes to translated fiction, I feel like there's always a little bit of a caveat there where I don't know if it was just the translation or something wasn't quite working going from the original language to English. Um, but this one I struggled through. This one I didn't feel like I had a good grasp of who the characters in the story were. I didn't really feel like I had a good grasp of what even was happening linearly through the story. Um, and it is exactly as the title suggests, one day in the life of a gulag prisoner, Ivan. The reality of what people faced in these kind of camps is horrific. And that part came through loud and clear. But it was interesting because in this one, the tone was almost detached in a way that it was just a day in the life. And it kind of showcased how normalcy is grasped for in situations like this. And even within something like a prison camp, the prisoners very quickly establish their own hierarchies and the normalcy of the days and the things that they really focus on to try to get themselves through the time that they're spending there. That all came through loud and clear. It was very confusing because a lot of the characters had multiple names and it wasn't always clear who was being talked about. Like it didn't, I didn't realize until halfway through the book that the main character was also called this other name and all of the things that had been about that second name were about him. That was very confusing to me and a lot of the characters had multiple names which made it difficult to follow. So this is one that I didn't connect with as much. Um, I would still recommend it if this is a period of time that you're interested in reading and for sure if you have read Alexander Solzhenitsyn and other works. For me this one was a read that just didn't didn't quite connect. 
All right, moving on to the next physical book that I read in August, and that is Return of the Griffin by J.C.M. Byrne. Now, if you guys have been around my channel for any length of time, you know that the first book in this series, Wistful Ascending, is one of my favorite indie reads of the last couple of years. I think it is just an incredible unique story and something that really adds a whole extra flavor to indie science fiction and fantasy. Um, it's the story of Rohan, who is a half-human, half-Ildrak hybrid. He was basically bred to be a living weapon. And he's retired now, and he's a tow chief on a space station called Wistful, where he basically pulls cargo ships in and out of the, the docking bays and he goes to his diner and he works his nine to five and he likes his eggs a certain way and it's a superhero space opera with so much heart and so much just it's such a fun read it's so good and and joe does a great job of of seamlessly weaving in some deeper moments into that story and just it's very very fun to read. It's a great palate cleanser in between a lot of the heavier stuff that we read in SFF, and I think that more people should read it. So if you haven't read Wistful Ascending, please put it on your TBR because I think it's really, really good. Um, this is book two, Return of the Griffin, and in this book, Rohan goes back to Earth, where he is originally from, um, to help save the world, basically, from these megaton... Uh, land sharks that are attacking the different continents on Earth. What I loved so much about the first book was that it was out in space, where so it's a secondary world. You have this sentient space station, you have this motley crew of characters and friends that surround Rohan. In this one, we leave that all behind and we go back to Earth. And I, when I'm reading science fiction and fantasy, if it's not like drastically different, I don't usually love earthbound stories and this case was the same um with return of the griffin because i think going and meeting a completely new cast of characters going back to earth it kind of lost some of the magic i think that i found in the original first book i think this book definitely does a great job of giving us a little bit of a window into rohan's past and his history and people that mattered to him in the early part of his life and I think that's really important. The other thing that that I personally have a hard time with in, in books is when it's a futuristic book that has a lot of very direct specific references to our current political climate. That's something like I'm around that all the time all the time in reality and I like to escape that when I read SFF and I'm not against authors putting whatever they want in their stories like this because that's completely their choice. Just subjectively for me as a reader, that is something that is going to take me out of the story quite heavily. So overall, this one was definitely a little bit of a dip in the series for me. Um, I'm really looking forward to getting into book three because I know we're going back to, I think, Wistful, the space station, and kind of back to our... Uh, first established cast of characters. I still really highly recommend this series, Wistful Ascending. I still love, it's such a good book, and I'm excited to go back to our original cast of characters in book three. Last but not least is all the manga that I read, which was all in one series. I read 10 volumes of Attack on Titan this month, and that has been a romp, <laughs> um, which is kind of a weird word to associate with Attack on Titan. Um, but I've really been enjoying it. I think it's a really interesting manga. The premise of it is, if you're completely unfamiliar, is there's a giant walled off section of land where the last um, remnants of humanity live, and they have these massive walls that keep out the titans, which are these giant, genderless, um, supposedly mindless things that come in. They look like humanoids, and they come in and they try to eat people, basically, and, and people are dying uh, if they're anywhere around the titans. And there is a group called the Survey Corps, which is a group of kind of subsection of the military that goes out and tries to 
push the boundaries of humanity further out and take down as many titans as they can and defend the walls. It is super heavy action focused. There's a lot of uh, body horror, I would say, so just be aware of that if you're if you're looking to get into it. But the storyline and the characters, I'm really, really invested in. I'm very curious. The mystery of like what the Titans are and how all of these pieces are so shrouded in mystery and where humanity is going from here. It is it is very intriguing so far and I'm really, really enjoying it. The main character cast is really interesting. I'm finding quite a few of them that I'm really loving. I think it's the type of manga that fantasy fans would definitely enjoy, uh, especially if you are looking for something as kind of a gateway to get into it. The one downside I would say to the manga, and I've been hearing that the anime is a little bit better with this, is that some of the action scenes are incredibly difficult to follow the way that they're drawn. Um, so that's been one kind of downside. And there's been a couple within that first 10 volumes, there's been a couple volumes that were a little bit more filler or I felt like they didn't really in you know interest me as much as the rest of the story but overall I'm having a really good time with this series I'm currently buddy reading it with Murphy Napier and I we've been having some great conversations about the ethics and philosophy themes in the story the characters that we're really loving so this is definitely a manga that I would recommend to you guys um do be aware that there is a lot of gore so you know if you're okay with that cool um and, but it's the mystery of it, I think, is really what's investing me at this point. So yeah, this is another recommended manga from me so far. And I think it's only 30 some volumes. Um, so it's not going to take us that long to finish it. And I'm really curious. I'm very excited to see what the secrets are uh, in this series and, and get to some reveals, bigger reveals going forward. It's going to be a great time. So that was my August and I'm going to pick a book of the month because that's something that I always forget to do and I'm going to remember to do it today. Uh, there's no competition for this one. Feet of Clay by Terry Pratchett has been hands down the top read for me this month. I absolutely love his work. I cannot wait to continue in the Discworld and read more of his books because they're just fantastic. So that's my book of the month officially for August. Please let me know down in the comments what you guys read this month. I would love to know your book of the month for August. Uh, I hope that you're all having a really fantastic week. I hope that you are all reading some five-star reads and I'll see you in the next video.